Beautiful. Thanks, Mamid. Sorry for that. Okay. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yeah, we can. Perfect. Okay. And I'll just make a big screen so you can see. So, terrific. Okay. Um, Mahmoud, at some point, I'm going to flip over to another device to show you the echoes. So you might just need to, to flip the screen share at that point, but um, we'll see how we go. Just bear with me. I'm just trying to make sure that I've got that lined up as well. Okay, we're good. Okay, so thanks very much, everyone. And um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Clyde Mahmood. I'm a neonatologist here at the Children's Hospital in Glasgow in the neonatal unit. And um, I think share all of your interests in uh, neonatal hemodynamics and uh, echocardiography is a part of that. So the case I was gonna present today is, is one that interested me because it took a while for me to appreciate what was happening in this patient. And um, it was a little bit of an atypical presentation. So the, the background was, well, the background actually starts a little bit more with the clinical case. So this was, this all happened on the weekend before Christmas on a Sunday, which I wasn't supposed to be working, but at short notice, I'm sure you've all had the same thing in your own units. Um, we needed the shift covered, so I volunteered for it. But uh, because of that, I suppose I was hoping for a relatively, um, uh, steady day without any without too many surprises and this was a patient who everybody everyone in the unit knew quite well an x24 plus five weaker who'd had prolonged rupture membranes a, a spontaneous preterm delivery with abruption so not the easiest start in life initial weight had been 750 grams and in the early neonatal course unsurprisingly had had uh, significant rds had received three doses of surfactant had required quite a prolonged period of, of ventilation thereafter, intercurrent sepsis episodes, um, had established feeds, but quite slowly, and had a picture of evolving chronic lung disease. So I'm going to jump you forward to the 43rd day of life for this patient. Um, and uh, oops, let's see, here we go. So their corrected age at this point was 30 plus five weeks. They're 1.1 kilograms. Uh, conventionally ventilated on the pressures and oxygen requirement that you see there, so still moderate ventilation, um, hemodynamically stable at this point, um, established on maternal breast milk feeds with fortifier that had been added in the past uh, few days, week or so, so on two early tube feeds, and with a picture of evolving lung disease. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Had had uh, two. Sorry, guys, can we make sure we you just mute the mics, please? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. So, um, the patient had had two previous unsuccessful extubations. One had been a planned extubation at day 35. The other one had been unplanned extubation at day 41, but um, had been left unextubated immediately after that because they seemed to be doing okay. And associated with those two extubations, they'd had two rounds of uh, uh, dexamethasone. Um, both were using the lower dose DART regime. And in fact, up to this point on day 43, having been re-intubated, that's the most recent part of the had then been uh, tapered off. So it stopped on that day. Sorry, guys, I'm just going to see if, whose mics are on just to see if we can mute them. That's great. Yeah, it looks like it's Anne-Marie. I don't know who Anne-Marie is. Um, uh, it's, oh, like it's, it's sorted. Ah, that's great. Thanks very much, everyone. Okay, so um, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Here we go. So this was the blood gas from the patient on that date, which was 18th of December. Um, so day 43 of life with that background that I just gave you. As you can see, compensated respiratory acidosis, perhaps not too surprising. And this was an x-ray taken that same day. Um, I'm sure you can interpret that for yourselves, but it's consistent with the clinical background. We've got a picture of 
quite significant involving chronic lung disease on that X-ray, low volume lung fields, um, and uh, degree of cardiomegaly perhaps as well. And I just would like to show you the echo from uh, that day as well. So what I'm gonna do is to do that, I'm just gonna stop sharing here and share on another device. Um, okay, hopefully you guys can see this. Great, that looks like it's working. Okay, so this is the same patient's echo on day 43 of life. Let's turn this gain up a little bit so you can see this brighter. So uh, inverted four chamber view of the heart. Um, and you can see here reasonable, even just eyeballing the cardiac function here, you can see reasonable uh, biventricular function. The septum certainly in this uh, four chamber view has a uh, nice curvature in it, symmetrical with a LV free wall. So there's not significant uh, septal flattening or displacement. If we look in a long axis view, parasternal long axis view, apex is just missed out of this view. But again, you can see uh, eyeballing the function looks like good left ventricular function. RV doesn't look dilated in this view. Perhaps a slightly enlarged left atrium. And consistent with that, if we look at a short axis parasternal ductal view, you can see here the aortic valve in the middle, uh, pulmonary artery uh, here on the uh, top left hand side of the screen, uh, dividing into right branch, left branch not visible. But here's a, a duct which will be obvious to you all, to you all um, between the uh, aorta and the pulmonary artery. And the Doppler waveform on that duct, as you see here, it's a continuous left to right flow, peak velocity 1.5, minimum velocity probably just under 0.5, so an unrestricted. Uh, left to right shunt in that PDA. There's another view of it there. So this was a PDA that we'd been aware of for some time. And um, we'd been, I suppose, conscious of its potential contribution to the patient's ventilator dependency. Um, but up to this point, um, had not gone down the route of, of considering PDA ligation. Uh, um, I won't go into it too much, but um, based on the other echocardiographic parameters, although we saw a little bit of enlargement of the left atrium there, there wasn't a significant uh, reverse diastolic flow in the uh, uh, celiac or the anterior cerebral vessels. And if we look at the descending aorta here, there isn't a reverse diastolic flow visible there either. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing there and come back to my PowerPoint. There we go. Okay, so um, that was the point that we were up to. And the patient who was relatively stable, but with those findings of evolving chronic lung disease and a, a PDA. So I took over the next morning, and even before I'd started the shift, and um, this was the the, the first gas the patient had had that morning. So you can see slightly uh, increased uh, acidosis, which is predominantly respiratory in nature with a CO2 that a little bit higher than we'd seen before, but with a partial compensation. And over the course of that morning, the patient started to have frequent desaturations whilst still on the ventilator at this point, which required them coming off and receiving uh, IP, manual IPPV at a uh, one-off temperature of above 38. And it was noted that on their, their bloods that had been taken early hours of the morning, the CRP was 12, having been less than 10 before. So as a precaution, um, patient was cultured and recommenced on antibiotics. They'd actually only been off antibiotics for about uh, 96 hours before that. We had a repeat gas um, just after that. And you can see again here that the respiratory acidosis is continuing to get worse. We've got hydrogen ion up to 76, CO2 up to nearly 15 now. Um, base excess is still positive and lactate appeared normal at that stage. So we decided to get uh, another chest X-ray at that point. And this was the X-ray at one o'clock on that day. And I suppose the two things that struck us were 
firstly, the right lower lobe, lower zone changes. Um, also, some dilatation of the, of the bowel. At that point, babies seem to be tolerating those feeds. Remember, it's maternal EBM with fortifier that they, they're on at that point. So we had a picture of respiratory acidosis, some focal changes on X-ray, um, and we thought maybe this is this is uh, just acute changes in, in uh, ventilation. And clinically, this baby had reduced air entry on the right hand side. So we did some uh, ET suction with lavage, and that was, I have to say that at, that at the time that felt quite um, satisfying because we got quite a lot of thickish secretions up, and clinically the air entry improved. And at this point, I was thinking that you know this was a respiratory compromise, and hopefully. Um, having made that intervention, things were going to improve. But over the course of the next few hours, baby continued to deteriorate. They were deep, continued to desaturate and their FiO2 was steadily increasing. Remember, we'd started the day in around 30, 40% oxygen. Based on the previous X-ray, we'd advanced the ET tube and we'd also increased the ventilation. The pressures had gone up quite significantly. The rate had gone up as well. And at this point, we were also getting a little bit concerned that baby's abdomen was looking a little bit more full. And what you can also see there is that they were starting to develop quite a significant gap between their, their central temperature and their peripheral temperature, and they certainly felt cool peripherally as well. So the picture here was one of worsening oxygenation quite acutely, worsening respiratory acidosis, a bit of a full abdomen, and now a sense of uh, perhaps impaired uh, systemic blood flow with, with an increasing core peripheral gap. Because of the abdominal distension, we got an X-ray at that point, and I suppose similar to the to, to the appearances on the chest X-ray that I showed you before, we were seeing a little bit of bowel dilatation, but nothing dramatic. I was concerned this baby might be developing late NEC, but there was nothing on the X-ray to support that. And, and clinically, although the abdomen was distended, it was quite soft. Baby was stooling okay. Aspirates were fine. Um, no blood PR. So. Although we were, we were concerned, there wasn't clear evidence of NEC. As a precaution, we did go on to stop the feeds. So remember, we'd increased the ventilation, and I was hoping at that point that for whatever reason that wasn't clear to me, this baby was just having a respiratory deterioration, and by increasing the ventilation, we would, um, we would compensate for that. But things were just getting worse, and by 6 o'clock that evening, the, the, you can see this gas was worse again. Hydrogen up to 85, CO2 up to 13.7. At this point now, we're getting a little bit of a metabolic acidosis as well. Basic cess has come down to minus three. But strikingly, the lactate had gone up significantly as well, up to 6.2. And I suppose that was starting to chime with, the, with the, the clinical picture of that increased core peripheral gap, temperature gap as well. So I was getting quite worried about the patient now because he was clearly deteriorating. We're in a lot more support than we started the day on. We'd made a few interventions, including reculturing, starting antibiotics, stopping feeds, but things just continued to slide. And I just, it wasn't clear to me exactly what was going on, which was a frustration in and of itself. And at this point, saturations were just on the mid eighties in, you know, maximum, maximal uh, inspired oxygen. We were on those higher conventional settings on the ventilator. The blood pressure was now dropping as well with uh, systolic of 30s, diastolic in the teens, low teens, with that ongoing core peripheral temperature gap. And we were seeing end organ dysfunction as well with uh, oliguria, urine output dropped off at this point. So we got another x-ray because I was still concerned as to why this patient was having this worsening acidosis, which initially started off as respiratory acidosis. And that didn't really give us any answers. It ruled out any major changes within the, the lungs, as you see here. We're back to this picture of uh, evolving chronic lung disease, but those focal changes that we'd seen earlier in the day seem to have improved after our suction and lavage. And at that point, we decided to do a trial of uh, high frequency oscillation, a reasonable settings map of 13, frequency eight, delta P of 28. I restarted darts, this time with a high dose regimen and um, added meropenem because I was just worried as to why this baby was continuing to deteriorate with worsening metabolic acidosis um, and was concerned that maybe there was a septic cause. And we'd already stopped the feeds at this point as well. And we did a repeat gas. And I, I was hopeful that having changed to high frequency with, with those generous settings, 
we would see a significant improvement. The CO2 had started to come down slightly. Hydrogen ion had come down a little bit, perhaps not as much as I would have hoped. But concerningly, the lactate was still on the rise. We're up to nearly eight now. So at this point, still not sure exactly what was going on with this patient. I did another echo. And I'm going to stop sharing again and flip over to show you that. Okay, so we'll start with a uh, apical four chamber view of the heart. Sorry, I always look at it inverted, but I can flip it around the other way if, if that's easier for people. But right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. And I don't know if you can remember that echo that I showed you earlier, which had been taken just 24 hours beforehand. But it's quite, there's, there is something of a change here, even in this apical four chamber view. First thing I'd say is, to me, this right ventricular function looks reduced, even just a, uh, subjectively assessing it here on the 2D loop. The septum that previously had that nice symmetrical shape compared to the LV free wall is looking flattened and actually quite immobile. And certainly you can, if you compare it to the function in LV free wall here, you can see that we've got significant reduction in, in, in septal function now. So a picture here of impaired right ventricular free wall and septal function, the LV free, free wall looking, if anything, a little bit hyperdynamic here towards the apex. Um, if we look at with some color on here as well, there's not much in the way of tricuspid regurgitation to see here. So that wasn't really giving any, us any sense of what the pulmonary pressures might be, but uh, we were able to see that from another route. And I'll come back to that in a second. This is a Doppler inflow across the tricuspid valve. You can see here from the four chamber view. If you're used to looking at these, normally what you get, especially in a baby at this, uh, this age, is typically a prominent initial wave, which you call E prime, uh, sorry, E wave, and then this later peak, the A wave. And the E wave represents early diastolic relaxation. And you can see here, even if I change the um, horizontal sweeps to show the scale, there probably is an E wave here, but it's fused with the A wave and it's of lower peak velocity than the A wave. So that's a sign that we're not getting that early, normal early diastolic filling of the ventricle. And we often see that in, in pulmonary hypertension. So we then went on to look at the, the duct. Here's a short axis view, pulmonary valve here, pulmonary artery, uh, right pulmonary, pulmonary artery branch there. And here's the duct and the aorta down here. So remember before, we were seeing uh, exclusively left to right orange flow in the duct. And this is clearly a change 24 hours later. We're seeing predominantly blue flow right to left uh, in the duct. There's a little flash of orange there as well. And when we did the Doppler, you can see predominantly uh, below the line, right to left shunt in this duct, a small left to right component as well. So we've had a complete reversal of the PDA shunting pattern in this patient, indicating an increase in uh, pulmonary artery pressure relative to systemic blood pressure and associated with that, that right ventricular dysfunction that we were seeing on the uh, four chamber view. If I show you a, a short axis two chamber view as well, here you can see the right ventricle at the top, left ventricle at the bottom, that flattening of the septum with uh, even just a, subjectively from, from the 2D loop here, uh, impaired septal function. Um, Actually, you can see that the, the LV free wall here anteriorly, uh, sorry, posteriorly is probably impaired as well, but there's perhaps better, slightly better function here anteriorly. If we look lower down in the short axis view towards the apex, again, you can see a septal uh, function here at the apex, not very good flattened septum, um, but perhaps slightly improved function in the free wall at the apex, uh, which confirms what we saw in the four chamber view. So in this echo, what we're seeing was uh, a picture of acute pulmonary hypertension with right confirmed with that right to left ductal shunt and associated with it significant right ventricular dysfunction and septal flattening. And having seen this, things started to fit together for me. It started to explain why this patient had deteriorated over the course of the day, presumably with worsening pulmonary hypertension over the course of the day. 
Um, I'm going to stop sharing here for a second. And let's go back to the PowerPoint. Oops, great. OK, so we just had a look at that echo. So based on, on that echo and, and the evidence we had of a, of a acute increase in pulmonary artery pressures and secondary right ventricular dysfunction and right to left shunting through the duct, um, we started nitric oxide almost immediately and we got a fantastic response. Uh, patients' oxygenation improved rapidly over the next five minutes. FiO2 was weaned down into the, the 50s fairly quickly. We repeated the gas after just half an hour of having started the nitric. And you see already that the CO2 has come down to seven, the hydrogen ion has come down to 52. Um, base excess hasn't got any worse. Lactate is still up at 8.4, but it's early days. We wouldn't expect that to change too quickly. And um, when we repeated the gas just half an hour later, things were continuing to improve. We actually overshot a little bit. The patient's now got respiratory alkalosis. Base excess is starting to get a little bit better and the lactate's starting to improve as well. And over the next uh, 12 hours um, on repeat CRP, the patient had actually had a significant CRP rise um, in excess of 90. And over the next uh, few days, having been started on DART as part of the management of this deterioration, they actually had a fairly rapid res ongoing respiratory improvement and continued to progress, wean on their extubation and extubate onto high flow. And in fact, just a few weeks later, they discharged to the local unit, still have a PDA, um, which cardiology are going to follow up. But I thought for me anyway, there was a lot of learning around this case. Um, it, it, it really frustrated me and concerned me during the course of the day why we didn't have an answer for this patient's worsening respiratory acidosis, re increasing CO2, and then what followed this picture of impaired systemic blood flow and impaired uh, oxygenation. And it was the, the functional echocardiography that really just gave us the answer and um, pulled all that together, showing this picture of acute pulmonary hypertension, which in retrospect was presumably being driven by evolving sepsis. But it was a picture that I suppose to me was a little bit atypical, rather than seeing a classic, um, uh, well, first of all, I think in a baby who's an ex-prem with evolving chronic lung disease, this picture of acute pulmonary hypertensive deterioration is a little bit unusual. It's, I think it's an unusual presentation of evolving sepsis in this setting, but it's, it was also for me a, a very unusual cause or an atypical cause of a worsening respiratory acidosis, which was the, 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 the main finding initially during the course of the day. And I suppose when I stopped to think about what was going on in this patient, in the, on the, on, up to that point, on up to day 43, where we started this story, the PDA phys pathophysiology was one of left to right shunting, leading to a little bit of pulmonary overcirculation. But I would say in this case, the, the hemodynamic significance of the duct was limited. I think there was some contribution to ventilator dependence, probably, but it, this wasn't a baby who had a severe he hemodynamically significant duct. But what was interesting was that in, those, in, in just those 24 hours, the PDA pathophysiology changed and we, the, the baby's hemodynamic pathophysiology changed to a picture of a pulmonary hypertension phenotype where actually the duct, to, the, the presence of the duct was possibly beneficial. It was to some extent providing a blow off for that right ventricle in the setting of acute pulmonary hypertension. And um, just to, to, to think about what was going on there in terms of the pathophysiology, I think we had a acute increase in pulmonary vascular resistance and pulmonary artery pressure, presumably driven by evolving sepsis. That promoted a right to left shunt in the duct and presumably that was contributing to the hypoxemia that we're seeing in this patient, but also to reduce pulmonary blood flow because of the increased resistance to pulmonary blood flow combined with diversion of flow through the, the, the PDA. And that presumably what was what was driving that worsening respiratory acidosis in this patient. And it was striking that there is part, that part of the response to nitric was not just an improvement in oxygenation, but a fairly rapid improvement in CO2 which of course the oscillator was probably contributing to as well at that point, but it needed the, the increased pulmonary blood flow to, to allow the oscillator to then bring the CO2 down. And the other component, of course, was 
increased RV afterload, contributing to that right ventricular and septal dysfunction that we saw, and the septal dysfunction leading in part to, to left ventricular dysfunction, but the combination of biventricular dysfunction giving rise to reduced cardiac output, which we saw present as that increased core peripheral temperature gap, cool peripheries, and the systemic hypotension that evolved as well. And of course, that combined with the hypoxemia presumably led to the lactic acidosis and the end organ dysfunction that we saw. The one thing that I've put in the slide here is also this, um, this potential for reduced coronary flow with increased RV afterload. And the concept there is that if the right ventricular pressure is increased, particularly in the setting of reduced systemic blood pressure, then the gradient for coronary blood flow is reduced to the right ventricle. And that combined with an increased metabolic demand at this point probably contributes to sort of a, a subclinical ischemia of the RV, which is part of the, the, the right ventricular dysfunction. It's a concept that, that um, was raised quite recently. There's a really nice paper um, in Journal of Perinatology by a uh, North American group talking about the, the pathophysiology of uh, acute pulmonary hypertension. Um, so, and, and they talk about that potential contributing uh, factor as well. So um, I hope that was an interesting case for yourselves. Um, as I say, I, I learned a lot from that case. I think, um, first of all, not to ignore the, the desaturating baby with worsening respiratory status, even if they have been stable for many weeks beforehand, but also I remember the potential for pulmonary hypertension to contribute to worsening respiratory acidosis in a setting. And I think the other thing is that in this patient, although the duct was potentially uh, contributing to, to, to adverse pathophysiology up to this point, potentially in a setting of acute pulmonary hypertension, it may have been beneficial in terms of offloading that right ventricle and supporting systemic blood flow. So thanks for listening and uh, really interested in your thoughts, everyone. I see a few hands up, uh, Amaima and Ronald. Oh yeah, thank you very much. This is very interesting, really. Uh, just one question here. Uh, thank you for explaining the cause of rise of carbon dioxide because I was thinking why the carbon dioxide raised and actually the immediate response with, uh, with uh, nitric oxide use. So this is, um, thank you for explaining this. It makes really a lot of sense. The other, um, my question is the use of steroids in the context of sepsis as uh, quite brave sometimes. Uh, I occasionally do the same, probably make sure that I cover with, with um, antibiotics like meropinum um, and continue with the DART rather than stopping it. Uh, but um, is there um, agreement or um, you know, is something that officially we can do without uh, or just from case to case? Or So what was the thinking behind using DART in the context of sepsis in this case? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Amaima. I think at the point at this point, I wasn't before I before we had the, the functional echo and it became clear what the underlying problem was. At, at that point, I was working on the basis that we had a predominantly respiratory deterioration, hence the restarting of the dart. Um, I was less concerned that there was sepsis because at that point we still only had this mild increase in CRP to twelve. But that said, we had started antibiotics earlier in the day vancomycin and gentamicin, and I did add meropenem in at the point of a starting dart. I'd be interested what other people's thoughts are about that. Um, to be honest, at that point in time, I was um, more concerned about the ongoing deterioration of the patient than about the, the that, you, you know, potential uh, effect of, of uh, steroids in the setting of sepsis. And I really just wanted to make sure that we were covering all bases. So um, I, I felt reasonably comfortable doing both at the same time there, um, knowing that I was on really good antibiotic cover whilst on, on high dose steroids. But what bothered me more was just that, that I didn't really know, I didn't, I, I didn't have a clear handle on why this patient was deteriorating up to that point until, we, until we'd done the echo and had seen the, the pulmonary hypertension. I don't, I'd be interested what others feel about that as well. Thanks, Amaima. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ronald and then Sal. Thanks so much, Neil. That was brilliant, actually. Um, I'm a neonatal reg in London down at Imperial. Um, it shows how important the right ventricle is, I think. Um, 
I have two quick questions for you, actually. So the first one was just a quick one. Do you and your unit routinely echo babies at 36 weeks who have got kind of definitions of CLD who are on low flow, for example? Because I, I feel like we don't do it enough and we don't probably use Aldenafil enough. I know the evidence is out for our um, kind of debate, but uh, I just wanted to know what you do locally. Second question I had was, um, I, I don't know how easy it is to share your screen again, sorry, but the, your, your, on your second echo, the uh, apical four chamber view that you showed, I wanted to ask about right ventricular function sort of calculations because if you look looking at the sort of lateral that analyst of the tricuspid valve, you could do a tapsy and probably feel like it's normal because the lateral uh, the tapsy probably looks like it's actually pretty good. Um, but we can you, you can see by looking at it, 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 the function definitely is down. So I don't know what other parameters do you use to objectively assess RB function apart from just sort of eyeballing because to me the tapsy there looks probably normal. So you'd be fooled to thinking that actually it was okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's almost a, a whole other kind of session where we could talk about assessment of right ventricular function. And um, I, I didn't show um, all different measures that we might use here, but in this particular patient, what I also do relatively routinely is tissue Doppler imaging. So yes. um, for those of you who, who might not have seen this before, basically we're using Doppler here, not to look at the velocity of blood flow, but to look at the velocity of the myocardium. They typically do it in the basal myocardium. This one's positioned in the septum, um, but, you, but I'll show you the RV in a second. Unfortunately, I didn't put an ECG on this patient, but what we can do is then uh, look at the ECG to know where we are in the cardiac cycle. But basically what you see in tissue Doppler, typically if I use this waveform here as an example, is in systole, this initial very fast spike, which is uh, said to coincide with isovolumic contraction within the ventricle, and then a more prolonged phase uh, longer spike, this one here, which is called the S wave, which represents systolic um, e ejection. And you can measure that velocity as a measure of systolic function. And then in diastole, you normally get a little bit of a gap here that's called isovolumic relaxation time. And then an early diastolic uh, wave, which is probably this one here, followed by a late diastolic wave here. And the early diastolic one represents early relaxation of the ventricle. And the, the second one represents atrial contraction, pushing a bit more blood and further displacement of the myocardium. So basically you can measure those systolic and diastolic velocities as a measure of function, but even just eyeballing it, you get a little bit of a sense of what's going on. So even just looking at the septum here, I'd say these velocities are pretty low. Um, typically I would expect them to be four or five or above. Um, the other thing is even in the septum here, if you look at the, the, the early diastolic velocity, there's one here and there's one here, but it's kind of lost on this beat and it's lost on this beat. Now, sometimes that happens just when you've got a baby with a higher heart rate. But I would say these are probably reduced velocities as well. So it's showing that there's a reduced early diastolic function within that myocardium. So I, I quite like tissue Doppler, not just as a quantitative, but as a qualitative kind of view on the, the function. And if we look at the right ventricle in this patient, so you can see here the Doppler has been moved to the right ventricle to the, to the myocardium here. Um, you see a similar pattern. The systolic velocities are probably not too bad. They're up at around five. Diastolic velocities are probably a bit lower, particularly in some of the waveforms here, and they're merged with it with a with a later A wave. So you get this kind of, kind of stepped appearance. So I would say there's some evidence of, of RV diastolic dysfunction in the free wall there, but we're only looking at longitudinal function because it's in line with it with it with the Doppler wave there, uh, Doppler uh, angle of intonation there, and we're only looking at that region of the basal RV. So it, Although we extrapolate from that to make comments about right ventricular function, just like TAPSI, as you say, Ronald, you're only looking at one part of the right ventricle. There are other advanced ways that you can quantify right ventricular function using strain analysis and things like that. I don't think I did in this particular patient, but I think the dysfunction here, as much as anything, just eyeballing it is, is in, the, um, in the apex and in the septum here of the right ventricle. And as you say, if we just did a TAPSI, which is looking at the um, uh, displacement of the, the lateral part of the tricuspid annulus there, it might look normal. I could do it here if I could remember, remember how to do it on the, on the echo analysis here. I've tried to do it for you if I can. Anyway, but uh, maybe that, that answers your question. And the second question was around um, routine screening at around term corrected in patients for or 36 weeks for evidence of pulmonary hypertension and targeted management of that. And uh, it's something certainly Mahmoud and I have talked about in the past and with Anne-Marie, our colleague as well. And um, my personal view is that, that 
I'm not sure that we still understand what the evolution of elevated pulmonary artery pressure, pulmonary vascular resistance in these patients is. Um, there are definitely some patients who have that associated with severe BPD. If you look at the studies, it appears that there may be a group who even have it separate to, to um, the classic definitions of BPD as well. And um, part of the problem about screening for these patients is that sometimes the, the classic indicators that we use for elevated pulmonary vascular resistance or pulmonary pressure, TR, septal shape, are a little bit subjective. You saw in this patient that even when they had significant right to left shunting through the duct, they didn't have <laughs> a cuspid regurge. So I think it's not an answered question. It's actually something we're, we're, we're um, developing our kind of our own, um, uh, you know, echo, uh, um, for our, our own timing for echoes at, throughout preterm period to try and get a better understanding longitudinally of which patients are at risk of, of elevated pulmonary artery pressure and what their cardiac function is associated with that as well. But I, I agree, it's a kind of unresolved question at the moment. And wh whether sildenafil is actually an effective treatment is also, um, uh, I would say, unresolved as well. You know, the, the, the studies are small, the only RCT um, uh, partially answered, but didn't, it didn't uh, you know, fully answer the question. Thank you so much. Saul, I think you were next. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Great. It was interesting. It's really like you, what the hell is going on and you don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Um, <laughs> That's right. Uh, two questions. First, um, has actually, it should have had a murmur. Uh, I know it probably would have been difficult to do, to assess the murmur when you went on a high frequency, but yeah. it should actually have changed, uh, in theory at least. Yeah. You know, you should have had a, a, a reasonably good amount of the, with the flow you had, consistent, no. And it should have disappeared because of the right to left uh, flow coming up. Uh, it's, um, I know, it's just a question as uh, anybody listened sort of before and after. Yeah. That would be one thing. The second thing, uh, what about uh, giving the speculation a bit about changes in VQ uh, uh, and explaining your sort of CO2 changes? Uh, first, uh, that's not unusual. I've seen quite a few babies reopening the, the, the duct when you develop the sepsis, and it's like prostaglandin playing up and the inflammatory markers on the really on the wall of, of the of the duct. But that would not really much explain the the, the, the ventilation changes. But if I counted out, there was about six rips when you had initial X-ray and about nine rips when you did. That means that you're really opening alveoli and then you really increase the areas to give out CO2. Now the ventilation that very much complicates. So if you're now adding up the impaired perfusion of the lungs that becomes completely a nightmare, which is which and which is mm. chicken or egg. But if you really had, and I, 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 you show that you had the sort of uh, right ventricular failure, which means your perfusion of the lungs was not brilliant. So in fact, you nearly had the, the both of them coming and going one, but in fact, actually, none of them were doing the right thing. Neither the perfusing getting O2 in uh, and O2 out, or CO2 out, because first you didn't have enough open areas on the relay, because we, we're talking yeah. about passive diffusion. So, you know, and then you actually, even if you opened it, it's still not perfusing enough because it's still, you know, not delivering enough CO2 to wash it out. And that's when you now became hypoxic because you're lactic ozone. So you're actually getting anaerobic rather than Krebs cycle. So it does really fit with the, with the, with the sepsis. But then which is which went in these 24 yeah. hours. It's like hell. Yeah. So I'm just offering you the angle from the sort of VQ point of yeah. view, which yeah. is usually interesting. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. I think on your first point, um, we we didn't uh, we we could hear a PDA shunt you know that morning uh, of PDA murmur in the morning but we didn't uh, yeah in retrospect it would have been interesting to know if that changed <laughs> for the day I don't yeah. have an answer for that the I think you're absolutely right I, I I think this this is about VQ mismatch and as you say the, the combination of probably lung recruitment um, uh, and opening up on on high frequency was probably combined with then improved. Uh, 
pulmonary blood flow and uh, QP as a result of, use, of commencing the nitric oxide. And it, it, it's difficult to identify, I suppose, wh which component um, uh, ultimately helped to improve the CO2. What I would say was it was really quite an acute response when we started the nitric oxide. And mm -hmm. you can see it in those gases. Just in, within half an hour, the CO2 was already coming down. And that's what made me think, you know, it's a combination of, of yes, yeah. Yes, we're yes we're improving probably wrong re recruitment. We're opening that lung, but we're definitely it was the improved pulmonary blood flow that then meant that the the the, the QPQS were, were better matched as well. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. your hydrogens, your uh, the sort of your hydrogens, your pH, yeah. that's another component of leading to the pulmonary uh, yeah. hyper hypertension. You know, yeah. on the even uh, on the vascular bed that is not necessarily like hyper uh, developed, but the uh, acidosis itself, it's enough. And I haven't seen pH because I know you don't use that, but uh, it usually helps me a little bit to yeah. do that. But with your hydrogen of 80, I think you've been something about 7.1 or even right. below yeah. that. Which yeah. uh, anything below 7.2 would lead to the increased pulmonary pressure. And on yeah. top of the reopen duct, that's another thing. But yeah, uh, just angle of VQ is also interesting this, but yeah. that's great. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, you go, sometimes you just go and do echo in another 10 hours and here you are, it's completely different. Yeah, exactly. And I think then what I haven't shown you guys, but I can show you very quickly is the subsequent echo um, from just afterwards. So, uh, sorry, I should have thought to show you this already. So this was the echo then repeated um, at, uh, so this was around an hour after starting the nitric oxide, where we'd already started to see an improvement in the gases. So um, it's all subjective, but be interested what your take is on the appearance, particularly of that septum now. Um, I would say function is still impaired, but possibly already a little bit better than it was before. Um, when we look at the ductal shunt, you can see that, and this is what encouraged me that we were ever, you know, that that the we were heading in the right direction. Um, th th you can see the ductal shunt was is again now predominantly orange, predominantly left to right. Let's see if I've got a Doppler of that for you. Uh, there we go. So that pattern that had been all right to left just an hour ago, having commenced nitric oxide, we now saw it flip back again to be. Uh, almost exclusively left to right, I guess it is exclusively left to right. And that coincided with the CO2 coming down very quickly as well. So as you say, so the VQ matching, that if QP had almost certainly improved, VQ matching had improved. And um, as the pulmonary pressures came down, we're seeing more pulmonary blood flow. So, uh, sorry, I know some, some more hands up there as well. Uh, I've got uh, E. Neary there and then Mahmoud. Elaine, yeah, Elaine, yeah. would you like to go first? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so thanks, Neil. That was an excellent presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask what, with increasing the pulmonary blood flow with the nitric oxide, does that improve your systemic circulation or did you have to support that separately because your blood pressure was quite low as well, et cetera? Yeah, that's a really good question. The, we'd, I didn't, I didn't uh, say <coughs> presentation, but we'd actually got some low-dose epinephrine or adrenaline ready to start at that point when the, just before we started the nitric oxide, but actually the blood pressure improved very quickly. In response to nitric oxide, and it was it's it's another one of those nice cases where you improve the the, the pulmonary hemodynamics and the systemic hemodynamics um, follow from that. So presumably, we then saw improved uh, left left sided filling, left ventricular output, and and the the blood pressure came up quite quickly. And in fact, we didn't need to start the adrenaline after all. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It was all incredibly satisfying because you can see the timings there. It was just just around the time of handover when I, <laughs> you know, when I was finishing the shift. So it was it was great to see everything improve and be able to go home knowing we had an answer and uh, that the baby was getting better. Mahmoud, thanks. Thanks, Neil. That's really interesting case. I was actually um, um, wanted to ask the same question, Elaine. I asked about the. Um, anotropic support, but I suppose it's just improving the blood flow to the lungs and improving the back flow back to the LV, improved everything, so it's really good. Other thing about Ronald's question um, is the, if you want to do a more kind of subjective assessment of the RV, you can do fractional area of change, you can do ejection fraction, 
And even with the echo that Neil showed, you can see the RV is very stiff. It's not actually relaxing and you know contracting and expanding. So if you do fraction area of change, I'm sure it will be very low, um, and and that will just coincide with the RV dysfunction as well. Thanks, Neil. Thanks very much, guys. I hope that was helpful. Um, I can. What I was going to do very briefly is just. Uh, in real time, if I can show you what Mahmoud was mentioning there. So if we measure, uh, here we go. That is probably the in systolic volume of the right ventricle. This is a bit of a quick and dirty way of doing it, but uh, let's see if we can do it. I'm gonna say roughly that that is the area of the right ventricle in, in systole. So we've got 0.64 centimeters squared. And then, oops. I'm gonna say that's in diastole. I don't know if we could, we could probably get it a little bit. Let's measure again. I'm being a little bit generous there, it might actually be smaller than that. 0.8 centimeters squared. So I think we'd find the fractional area change there is actually quite quite low, exactly as you say, um, Mahmoud, would you agree? Yeah, absolutely, Neil. Um, and I think anything less than 35% is just low yeah, and that right. coincides with the RV dysfunction. Cool. What? Thanks very much, everyone. Hope that was interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's really that interesting. Sure. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Well done. Okay, guys. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Good to see you all. Thank Thanks. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank okay. you. Lucinda, shall we leave the lung ultrasound score for next week, if that's okay? Yeah, sounds good. Sorry, Great. Lucinda. I, I apologize Did I, if I used all the time. No, no. No, that, it's that, fine. That's very interesting case, Will. We'll do a long presentation next week. Okay. okay. Look, look forward to it. Thanks, everyone. Bye Thank now. Thank you. Cheers.